In this theorem, we are going to look at the proof of the correspondence theorem for rings. Well, let's first of all look at a statement of the theorem. We're going to let R be a ring, and I is an ideal of R, so I want to write that down. This is an ideal. And um, the correspondence theorem says that there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between the subrings S of R that contain I and the subrings of R mod I. And the correspondence is given by S corresponds to S mod I. Uh, and then the, cor the correspondence theorem goes on to say that the subring S is going to be an ideal in R if and only if the subring S mod I is an ideal inside of R mod I. Now, if we look at this particular picture, it suggests a possible way to prove the correspondence theorem. We know that pi, the canonical map, is a ring homomorphism from R to R mod I, and we know that the kernel of that canonical map is going to be the ideal I. In other words, we're going to let pi of R be R plus I, and under this particular ring homomorphism, the kernel of pi does turn out to be the ideal R. And we want to exploit the canonical map pi for all that we can in the proof of the correspondence theorem. So let's start with this idea. Let's let S be a subring of R that contains the ideal I. So S is up here. And I already know that pi, taking R to R mod I, I want that to be the canonical map. So let's let pi be the canonical map. And that means that pi of little r is just the left coset r plus i. Now, I also know that pi is a ring homomorphism. And I know that the image of a subring is always going to be, uh, of a ring homomorphism, is going to be a subring of the target ring r mod i. That was in our previous video. And so the only real question is this. Is pi of s equal to s mod i? Well, let's look at that particular idea. Pi of s is nothing more than the set of pi of little s's, where little s belongs to the subring s. And that's just by the definition of what we mean by the image of s. But we know what, little, what, what pi does to any little s. That's just going to be little s plus i. And so we've got the set of little s plus i's, the set of left cosets of i, where the coset representative is pulled from the subring s. And this is by the definition of our map pi. But if we look at this set, that is nothing more than s mod i, where this is literally nothing but the set of left cosets of the ideal i with representatives inside the set s. So what we've now got is the following. Every subring S of our ring R that contains the ideal I is indeed sent to a subring that we can call pi of S but that pi of s is now known to be s mod i 
And S mod i is indeed a subset of R mod i. So we have one direction of our um, correspondence. We know how to go from S is a subring of R that contains I that will go down to S mod I is a subring of R mod I. To get the correspondence going back the other way, we have to turn the picture around. So let's look at that idea. Let's now let J be a subring of R mod I. In other words, J is going to sit down here. And I want to look at the pre-image uh, under pi. Remember, pi is going this away. Um, and so this is pi of r, and this is pi of i. And what I want to notice is I want to be basically be looking at the pre-image of j. Is the pre-image of j a subring of r, and does, well, let me actually change this to is, i a subset of the pre-image of j? If the answers to these two questions, so if both answers, are yes, then we have the correspondence that we need. Then we have our correspondence. So I kind of want to look at this issue much, much more carefully. So let's think about what we can say. We know that J is a subring of R mod I. Now that's going to tell me the following things. First of all, the elements of J are left cosets of I. And second of all, if I take two left cosets of, of I that belong to J, if x plus i belongs to j and y plus i belongs to j, then I know two things. First of all, I know that the difference of the cosets, x plus i minus, and this is a coset minus, y plus i, that has to belong to j. And I also know that x plus i times, and this is a coset multiplication, y plus i belongs to j. And I want to think about what those two things mean in terms of the pre-image. So we're going to use these facts when looking at the pre-image. So now let's look at this. I'm going to assume that x and y are inside the pre-image of j. So what that tells me is that x plus i belongs to j, and y plus i belongs to j. And let me get rid of that spurious thing right there. Now, I'm really wanting to know whether or not, so I want to kind of get this idea down. I want to see if x minus y belongs to the pre-image of j and x times y belongs to the pre-image of j. Because if both of those two things are true, then the pre-image of j is going to be a subring over in the ring R. So let's now look at what we've got. Since x plus i and y plus i both belong to j, we know the following things. We know x plus i minus y plus i 
belongs to j. But x plus y minus y plus j is nothing more than x minus y plus i. And he has to belong to j. And this is making a note that x plus i minus y plus i is known to be x minus y plus i inside the ring r mod i. And we know this belongs to j because j is indeed a subring of r mod i. But this statement here says that x minus y does indeed belong to the preimage of j. Well, we have a similar kind of thing for coset multiplication. So let's look at that. x is inside the preimage of j, and y is inside the preimage of j. Imply x plus i and y plus i belong to the belong to the subring j in r mod i. But uh, that also says that x times y plus i, which is equal to x plus i times y plus i, has to belong to j because j is a subring. And this statement says that x times y does indeed belong to the preimage of j. So to what we've now done is we have indeed seen that x and y belonging to the preimage of j implies x minus y belongs to the preimage of j. And x times y belongs to the preimage of j. And so that does say that the preimage of j is a subring of the ring R. In other words, I now know that I've got a subring when I go back on that projection, but we still have to deal with the question, does the preimage of J contain the ideal I as a subset? Well, let's look at this. Let's let A be any element of I. Well, that implies that A plus I and 0 plus I are exactly the same element. They are both the 0 element of the quotient ring R mod I. And um, J, of course, is a subring of R mod I, and that's enough to say that the zero element of R mod I belongs to J. And that tells me that A plus I does indeed belong to J, and that tells me that A does indeed belong to the preimage of J. And so what we've done here is we've seen that A inside the ideal I implies A is inside the preimage of J, so we can indeed say that I is indeed a subset of J. And what that tells me is if I redraw this picture, and I am thinking about this mapping being the natural map, if I have a subring down here, its preimage is indeed a subring up here. And of course, if we look at pi applied to pi inverse of j, that's going to be j. So j will be pi of 
pi inverse of j modded by i. Um, and so what we really do have then is a one-to-one -one correspondence. So in other words, just to tie up what we've got on this one is the following thing. So s going to s mod i is indeed a one-to-one -one correspondence between the subrings of R that contain S and the subrings of R mod I. We will look at the fact that this correspondence sends ideals to ideals in the next video.